It is uh, my um, pleasure to introduce to you the Reverend Jan Brown from Spirit Works. Uh, she can tell you a little bit about her work, but um, she and uh, and uh, one of our former parishioners, uh, Lauren McDonald, are, are are really the coordinators of recovery ministries in our diocese, and also. Uh, are impacting the larger church. Um, a few years ago, they organized a diocesan-wide conference uh, on recovery and, um, and addiction. It was phenomenal. B.J. Taylor uh, was, uh, and I were a part of that, and uh, it really, I had had uh, some experience with recovery ministries in the past, but that conference really updated things. And uh, also, I, I spent part of my sabbatical doing quite a bit of reading around uh, addiction and uh, trauma uh, and, um, and, and the whole nature of, uh, of, of the brain in that process. So um, it is, uh, it, it's just really great to have you here, and I thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning. I tried to put like all of those pictures so that you all would sit over here, but I clearly <laughs> There are some things that we can't, there's some things we can change the liturgy, but we can't change seating. <laughs> I tried. So, my name is Jan. Um, I'm a woman also in long term recovery, which for me means that I haven't used drugs or alcohol for 32 years. Wow. Congratulations. So, thank you. That's what uh, really drives the work that I do. Um, also, I think the other driver of it is when I entered into recovery, one of the things that I wanted to do was to make a difference in the life of a child. So those two things have been really the foundation of certainly who I am. My entire adult life has been spent in recovery, so I'm very grateful that, that recovery found me at a very early age. Um, and again, just being able to dedicate the, the life and my work that I do um, around children. Sadly, it doesn't mean that I work with children as often as I'd like, and I'll talk a little bit about the summer camp that we had this past um, in August, but I'm going to talk first about opioids, because that's often what, what drives people to this conversation. Um, and certainly, I will also frame some of a call to action in what you all might might be interested in doing. Um, I hold this sweet and low pack for a reason. So 300, this amount of sweet and low will, would kill 300 people if it had fentanyl in it. Um, and so that's, that's the significance of, of the work that I get to do every day. The strength of, of fentanyl is what's driving deaths um, in certainly this area, but in across the nation. And although we hear that um, there were 72,000 men and women who died last year, sadly, in the Commonwealth of Virginia in our first quarter, um, if the numbers continue as they are presently, we will have and see more deaths than ever. Um, what that's attributed to, I can't really say, other than we've, we've had large batches of drugs come in. Um, if, if some of you saw the, the news a couple of weeks ago, there was a big arrest. Um, people are very excited by it. And, and had that amount of drugs made it to the street, it could have caused everyone in Virginia and everyone in Maryland to die. So it, it was a, a tremendous um, bust to get all of those drugs off the street. It also demonstrates the demand that people have for drugs. Um, I was I served on the Commission on Impairment and Leadership with um, former presiding bishop Catherine Hetzet, and and one of the things that we really worked on was the, being able to recognize um, addiction and misuse in clergy um, primarily, as well as extended family in the Episcopal Church and. Uh, while we made, gosh, I think 16 to 20 recommendations, uh, which led to resolutions at this past general uh, convention, 
we haven't enacted them very well. And so one of the hats or roles that I play is continued leadership in the Episcopal Church around impaired clergy. One of our hopes is that we will get a clergy-wide uh, wellness program that's, that's based similarly off of what we do for airline pilots, physicians, etc. Um, my hope with this is that it'll be a conversation so that any questions that folks have, feel free to, to stop me and ask your questions. Uh, one of the other places that I've been working is with Province 3. So Province 3 includes West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, and so because of the, the issue of opioids in primarily West Virginia, um, a task force was developed and, and so that we could address our response to addiction and overdose. And we've been working together for about three years and, and have done really powerful and wonderful work such that um, the current presiding bishop decided to elevate that group of us and create a task force, a church-wide task force, that is working on the response to opioids. And so we will be meeting in Maryland. Our first face-to-face -face meeting will be in November. But part of what came out of our, our meeting with one another was my desire to have a summer camp for children. And for years, SpiritWorks Foundation, which is the nonprofit that I started, um, we had a summer camp. And, and it went well, and we did it for four years, and then we decided to, to, to do work on some other things. And out of this province-wide task force, they allowed me, the task force in terms of, as well as the Camp and Conference Center for the Diocese of Maryland, which is called CLAGIT. And so we were able this year to have eight children come from all of the different dioceses. I brought two from down here and participate in the first ever children's camp that was dedicated to children of opioid addiction specifically. Um, we were very successful in our camp. Some of the highlights and things that I learned were every year, whenever we did this, um, one of the things that we start with is having children and youth write letters to addiction. Um, I'd left some on the table so that you all could see them, but I wanted to share a couple that are clean with you. I allowed the children to say whatever they needed to say, so some of them I uh, pulled out, um, and then others only had one or two uh, bad words in them. So, dear addiction, why my dad? Why did you pick him to do drugs? It hurts me every day to see families and happiness, and my friends talk about their awesome dads, and mine can't even say, Happy birthday. He can't even come to any graduation. I can't even say I have a dad. The most hurtful part of it all is he almost killed my brother's mom because of you. And I don't even know if he's alive or dead. But in any more reality, he messed up. So I'm glad he's out of my life so he can't mess up my life anymore. But I still kind of love him matter what. One of the things that they all had in common was, and it was a strange one, that, that dads weren't present. Um, some dads were in jail, some dads, the children didn't know where they were. We took a camper as young as eight years old, which was kind of a risk. Um, and in the beginning, it was okay. As camp kind of wore on, she started getting tired. And so, of course, behavior problems started happening. But one of the hopes with this camp was, for me, was that the kids just be able to play with the kids. Mm -hmm. And so, um, once a day, they would work with me and we'd have a small group where we'd really talk through the issues that they were facing in their lives. And then the rest of the time, they just got to play as campers and do regular camp things. Um, also, in terms of highlights, one of the, the pieces that struck me, 10 years ago, if I were to ask one of the children, um, you know, what would happen? So one of the things is a healthy and appropriate response. What would you do if you came home from school and your mother was lying on the couch? And 10 years ago, the answer would be, my, I would 
go and I would give her a blanket and we'd be very quiet, we'd get our snacks and then we'd go do our homework. This time, the little boy said, if I came home from work and my mother was lying on the couch, I'd go and I would check to see if she was alive or dead. Very, very different response. Um, and initially, I wasn't expecting such responses. Um, I've been trained to, to facilitate children's programs and children's. Um, but the intensity of, of what we're dealing with now and the things that these children have been exposed to is, is particularly striking. Um, another time we asked the child, there was a, a kind of a, an assessment, if you will, that talked about true or false. So the question was, true or false, would you be embarrassed to bring friends over to the house? And this young man said it was true that he would. And so my follow-up question to him was, how come? And 10 years ago, the response would have been, because my parents might be drunk and, and I would be embarrassed. Uh, during this particular camp, the answer was because there might be needles around my house. Um, so once again, the level of intensity and the things that they're seeing are very different. Um, that particular question and some of the other things that we did really, really caused me tremendous concern as well as the leaders of the camp because some of those issues begin to look at how safe a child is in their living environment and whether Child Protective Services needs to be involved and all of those kinds of things. Um, and during, yes? What's the age of the campers in general? I know you said sure. young as eight, but what? So fourth to eighth grade were oh. the ones that we took. So, so very young kids. Um, and, and so it became an issue as to what, what do we do with the information that these children are sharing with us. Uh, and, and so we, we consulted, I'm, I am a mandated reporter, um, as is the, the camp director and the conference center director. So it was, it was tricky because we wanted them to be able to share and tell their truth and those kinds of things, but we also wanted to make sure that these children were safe in their households. Um, one of my struggles all week, um, how many of you are familiar with Narcan or something, the reversal drug? So one of my concerns all week was, do I train these children on how to use Narcan? Um, <laughs> real question, yeah. And, and I agonized for the week um, as to whether I should or shouldn't, and I chose not to. Um, in hindsight, as odd as it will be, next year we will train them in Narcan. Um, and part of what we learned, I, I was able to go and meet with the, the coordinator of, of, for the Department of Behavioral Health, who said, yes, we've trained as young as four and five years old. Um, because they, it's there, and so they need to know how to be responsive to, to what they're seeing in their households. Um, which again is kind of mind disorganizing when, when one thinks about it. Now we're looking at a kind of a different way of approaching it, which is, a, a, is what's called a harm reduction. Um, and so it's going to reduce the level of harm if your mother or father or whoever it is doesn't die. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, and looking at interesting ways of being able to support life for, for these particular children's families, as well as certainly for the families and the people that we work with. Um, we had a death a couple of weeks ago, which was, which was really difficult. So one of the things that I get to do is funerals um, for people whose loved ones have overdosed and died. And sometimes these families are willing to talk about the circumstances around these deaths, and sometimes they're not. And so we're ever respectful of the wishes of the particular families. Um, this month, as you all know, is uh, National Recovery Month. It's a, a pretty exciting time for us to highlight the, the folks who are in recovery, and it's something that we really enjoy doing. And August 31st is Overdose Awareness Day, and so we always pause to, to honor that particular day um, before moving into the month of September with celebration. It's really, really important for us and for the families that we serve to be able to, to mark this, the period of time for their loved ones. And it was a, an unusual piece this year, again, because of the, the young lady who was 24 who died, we had had the good fortune of meeting her because we held a conference. So we were with her on Monday, her mother was with us on Tuesday, 
we came back to Williamsburg on Wednesday and she died um, Wednesday evening. And so as, as tragic as it was, um, the mom has some, some peace. She hadn't seen her for 14 months. And so she was able to see her and be with her for that period of time. She had gone to treatment um, and, and, and looked good. And so, as, again, as difficult as that was, her mom is very pleased and has now dedicated herself even more to doing the work of supporting people who are attempting to be in recovery. Yes? Do you see a lot of suboxone? We see probably more suboxone than um, the other two FDA approved medications. Does everybody know what suboxone is? So there are three FDA approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder. One is suboxone, which is, is now the one that, that people are, are using mostly. Then methadone, which has been around for many, many years. And then now trexone, which they often use what, in the form of Vivitrol as an injection, which is supposed to last 30 days, but it doesn't quite last 30 days. So we see a lot of return to use relapses um, at about day 26. Um, and, and so we've been working with the, uh, the company that makes it to say, can, can, it, can you do something for us so that it will last for 30 days? There's a, the, the same company makes uh, that particular medication that makes a psychiatric medication. And why and how they've been able to figure it out um, for folks with psychiatric illnesses that if it starts leaving your body quicker, um, that it's broken down quicker, you can get another injection. Um, before the month is over. So we've got a ways to go. There's still lots of discrimination around people who, who use medication to, to treat and then support their long-term recovery. Um, I'll be kind since I'm on camera. There's <laughs> a lot of bad practices around, around that. Um, for example, uh, there's, there's no other illness where we require you to in order to get the medication that you have to do counseling, right? I, I go to the pharmacy and pick up my medicine and they, they offer it to me, right? And I may sign usually that I don't want the counseling, but I can still be prescribed the medication. Um, with, with these three medicines, there is no, if you do not participate in counseling, you may not have the medication, which is a bad practice of medicine. I'm, I'm a psychiatric nurse at uh, Centurion. Uh-huh. So one of the things with most of these drugs, naltraxone and suboxone, is you have to detox sure. before you take it. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and it doesn't do any good unless you completely detox. Mm -hmm. Correct. And get those um, new sites. Yes. Well, one of the, yes. And one of the things that we're seeing <laughs> now as a response to, especially overdoses across the country, and now we're starting to see it in Virginia, is that emergency rooms are now prescribing um, Suboxone, which again, while it's a good idea, um, what it means is that we've already decided what kind of medication a person needs, which again, we don't decide that based on until people do assessments and things like that if you have a different illness. So um, there are states, Rhode Island offers all three of those medications. Um, to somebody in the emergency room, to somebody who's in jail or prison, um, rather than deciding for them what medication they need before they're even assessed. So there's a lot of, we have a long way to go, um, is, is the bottom line. Um, one of the things that, uh, I, I had the good fortune last week to be at a meeting at the White House with um, the major insurance companies. And so we had a we had a good conversation. Um, I kind of I did my research before I went, and so I got to know and learn a lot about insurance companies, and and that they're not the bad guy, which uh, some folks would certainly lead me to believe, and and others as well. And and what's so difficult about all of this is what is the desired outcome, right? So most people go to treatment um, once they get there. Uh, and family members send their loved ones to treatment <coughs> under the assumption that that person is not going to use again, right? There is no treatment center except for one in the United <coughs> States that promises that. And yet, that's why we think we're going to rehab and that's why we send our loved ones. 
And so what often happens is we decide that people fail, right? So the individual who returns to use decide that they fail. The people who send the folks, the loved ones, <coughs> think that they wasted their money. They, they'll go that far um, because the person that they love failed, that didn't have success. And, and what's unusual about that is that, again, the treatment centers don't say that. We make that assumption. Um, and so somehow there's a huge disconnect. And so we need to do a, a much better job of, of knowing why we're going to rehab and what outcome we're looking for. Um, and the insurance companies agree with that as well. I mean, they're, you know, one of the, the phrases that I learned about was fraud, abuse, and waste, and just how much in this particular industry of treatment that there is. And a large part of it is because there, it's not regulated. Um, and so many other disciplines are regulated, and, and again, most family members don't know this. Uh, one of the things that I learned, which still bothers me, is about in-network and out-of-network. And, and in-network, the insurance company has some, they have a contract with, with the, the provider, and so they have some influence about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. If you are out-of-network, like most of the, the commercials that we see, right? Those commercials where we'll come pick you up, we talk to you in the middle of the night, families are desperate, individuals are desperate. Those are out of network facilities, and so they can do pretty much what they want to um, because the, the insurance company doesn't have any hold over, over them to, to, to practice in a certain way. Um, which is, again, it's really discouraging when a person is desperate or a family is desperate in trying to get their loved ones the help that they need. And, and so that's another area that, again, Monday I learned about. So, so it's another area that we've got work to do. Um, one of the things in Virginia is that we have worked, and in the country truly, worked really hard on attempting to save lives. In some places that trend has tipped. However, we don't have the next steps in place for folks once we've saved their lives. And so people get frustrated, right? It's like, how many times do we have to pr provide Narcan to somebody? Um, and so we, we get angry and we start calling folks names and, and it's exhaustion. Um, I learned a, a new word, it came in my email uh, this morning called radioactive charts. I've never heard of such. And because I'm practicing good behavior, at the stoplights, I didn't look at my phone. But, uh, it's very tempting, and, and I, I've come up with a thought. What radioactive charts means is that you don't want to touch this person. And so that's the new language that's being used in the medical field. Um, so, so again, things are getting much more difficult in, in that vein. Questions or comments before I keep going? Yes. Um, regarding the what to do after they're saved. Um, I, I, I read um, this summer uh, 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 an author, a Canadian physician, uh, Gabor Mate, who talks about the whole uh, aspect of trauma that has to be addressed as, um, as part and parcel of addiction, that, that there is a reason for that addiction in terms of the trauma. And he defines trauma, not it, we think of of the, of the big traumas, right. but he talks about trauma as uh, as something. You know, it's, it's what we experience on the inside, and it can really be affected by the sensitivity of, of, of someone as well. Could you just say something sure, about sure. that? Sure, sure. So Gabor is actually a good good friend of mine, um, and he he's very impressive. I, I was he's doing. very bright. He yeah. he's, he's he's as he ages, he's more and more difficult to understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True of us all. <laughs> I, know, I, I hope to resemble that one day. Um, but he has done a lot of research, both using his own lived experience yeah. as well as his experience as a physician. And one of his assertions is, is that trauma is involved in 100% of people's addiction. And so we talk about the big T is kind of how we frame it, and the little T trauma. And, and essentially it is that a person doesn't have the inner set of skills to manage whatever that experience is. So for some people it could be I'm 13 years old, I have a 
first love and I think this person is going to love me forever and they end up splitting up with me and I don't have the inner skill set and I have the sensitivity that I don't know how to manage that. I don't have anybody that I can talk to about it and so I begin to use alcohol and or drugs to self-medicate. So, And we know that the majority of the people who are using it, it really is about self-medication. Yes? So I'd like to follow up. The other big thing is the big T. Yes. Yeah. Big T, I'm sorry. P. 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 Oh, P. Okay. Yeah, so my experience is I, I treat junkies and then I treat uh, people that didn't start that way, that drifted into it uh, through prescription and then street drugs because they couldn't afford the prescription anymore. But at the end of the day, when you take uh, the opioids where they still have the pain. Right. So, so I'm going to challenge you to use a different word than junkies um, moving forward because one of the issues is around, is around stigma um, and shame. And so one of the things that has to change is the language that we use when we're talking about people with, with opioid use disorder or, or any addiction for that matter. Um, because they too are experiencing some set of pain one of the pieces that we're really starting to pay attention to is what's called uh, the, the determinants, the social determinants of health. And so those we often think of as junkies are usually folks who are coming from lived experiences which none of us can imagine, right? Poverty, um, violence, and, and so they're living with that and, and, and it is very different than what you described, which is somebody who has pain is then given a, a, a prescription, <clears throat> rightly so, for an opioid, has the brain sensitivity and the trauma, begins to use. Um, at some point, they are, they are no longer being prescribed, but because they are now dependent, if not addicted, they turn to, to street drugs, illegal drugs, in order to, to support their habit. Um, at some point, it is not about getting high, it's about not being dope sick, is how they describe it, not wanting to go through the pain of withdrawal. And so they continue to use, despite horrific consequences, um, seeing their friends die, going to jail and prison, uh, loss of family, on and on and on, but they continue to, to, to use anyway. Yes? Brain sensitivity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we in, the, in another time would say it's in our family, some have it, some don't. You know, some can handle it, some can't. And um, what do you say about that? I mean, it's, it's a true scientific yes. situation. Yes, it, 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 there's this, the brain science is absolutely there. So this past year, two years, I spent studying um, because I wanted to know the answer to those questions. And I pursued a master's of science in addiction studies through an international program. So my, my degree has been um, comes from BCU's medical, medical college, the University of Adelaide, as well as King's College in London. And one of the things that I wanted to do was learn the science so that we could use evidence-based practices. But I also wanted to cut the time that it takes to go from science to the community. And so we were able to do that because science is 20 years ahead of where we are right now. And it takes about 10 years to go from science to practice. And then it takes about another 10 years to go from practice to the community level, so to families and individuals who are really struggling. Um, and so we've been able to do a tremendous amount of that. And what we're trying to do is, as they're working on national levels, we're trying to push that bottom up so that, that the science is really meeting practice. One example of the science is using medication. Um, and there are some mutual support groups that if you use medication, you're not clean and you're not welcome to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and so those kinds of things happen, which contribute to pe the isolation that people experience and their perpetuation of use. Uh, one of the things that we know about pain medication is that while it's good at treating physical pain, it works even better for psychic pain and emotional pain. So again, being, being a mask for that trauma or helping somebody manage and cope with their trauma, um, pain, med pain medication really works well for that. We, uh, SpiritWorks has been working with two jail programs, but now primarily one in, uh, on the peninsula. And one of the things that we see is that 
of those women have experienced pain. Many have come in and out of the criminal justice system. Many of them have come in and out of rehab treatment centers. And the missing ingredient has always been that their trauma was not dealt with. And so um, we've had the very good fortune of working with one of the experts in the field of trauma. And so we've been able to help them pair both of those things at the same time. Because if we would use two, potentially, if we were carrying the level of trauma that they um, we, my Our first couple weeks there, there was a young lady who's, who's rightly in jail for what she's done, and her child died, her infant died. And so to see, to, to kind of go through that with her, and then to hear from the other women in the, in the program say things like, well, my, my two infants were stillborns at seven months. My daughter also died. And so again, the level of, of trauma that these women are dealing with um, is profound and, and for me, unimaginable. Um, and to begin to teach them coping skills that match that level of trauma, grounding skills so that they can come present and learn how to manage and deal with some of those things is equally profound. So, I mean, the good news there is that there is a response. Um, you know, one of the things that I continue to go on record for, even though I think I need to massage how I say it, is that overdoses are preventable. Uh, people do, do not have to die from, from drug overdoses. Our management and our support of individuals who are going to continue to use is, is where we fail, right? So, so with other illnesses, we offer clean needles. Um, and so people aren't, right now in this community actually, um, in Norfolk, the, the rates of HIV, hep C, um, are, are going up 200% um, the last look that I did. Um, something that I had heard of but never knew anyone, hep A is now um, making its, uh, rearing its ugly head, and, and so it's something that people aren't prepared for. I mean, so you've got 22-year-olds who have hep C, um, and you've got physicians who still say, in order for me to treat your hep C, you have to be clean for a year, um, which we don't say for other illnesses. It's back when we used to say to alcoholics, we won't give you, we won't treat you for a new liver unless you have a period of, of abstinence. Um, that's the practice of bad medicine. Right? We don't do those things for people who have other illnesses. And so just being able to support folks who are on that journey is, is so important. And I know one of the things that you all have been in discussion about and are working on is, is how do you all become a, a safe haven? Um, or do you become a safe haven? Because along with being supportive of this particular group of people come a lot of risks. So I was, um, I met with the chancellors years ago at the beginning of this epidemic, and they had me out this past Thursday at their retreat center, or at their retreat. So um, one of the things that we talk about, the chancellors are, are our legal arm, we work for the diocese, is what level of responsibility do we have if there's an overdose on our grounds? It's a good question, something to think about. Um, what level do we have if, if we offer Narcan? Because a, a lot of parishes' response is becoming getting people Narcan trained and sometimes being able to help with the dispensing of that. What is our level of responsibility if we train and, and <coughs> dispense or hand out Narcan and somebody overdoses and, and has a fatal overdose? <coughs> what is our level of risk and responsibility? And so those are real live things that, that folks um, are struggling with in terms of how best for, for churches to respond. I know that there are um, several AA meetings that meet here. Um, and my understanding is there's an Al-Anon meeting that also meets at, at your church. And, and again, what is that level of risk and responsibility? Um, and, and how do we manage that being members of the body of Christ? And, and so all pieces that need to be part of the conversation, all pieces that with intention people need to decide um, you know, how are we going to manage those things. Many churches have done it. Um, thankfully, at the end of my conversation with the chancellors, 
it wasn't something negative, it was something that we as the body of Christ want to figure out how we can do. Uh, one of the things that we are uniquely positioned to do as, as Christians is to walk alongside, right? The, our, the example that we were given um, through Jesus Christ is that we can walk alongside people in ways that other folks can't do, right? A teacher can't do it. A physician can't do it anymore. Therapists and counselors aren't in a position where they can do those things anymore, but we can. And by nature, that's who we are, is, is people who can walk alongside others through their pain, through their joys, sorrows, and, and everything else. And so being able to figure out how we can do that. Um, I've been working with VCU for the past three or four months in the Virginia Department of Health. And we're beginning to train across the Commonwealth people who are not necessarily directly affected by addiction and people who want to be able to do this walking alongside. And so they, they have developed a recovery ally program. And, and it's been one, wonderful to train with them around that program because it allows people to make informed choices around what level of, of engagement they want to have. And so one of the things that we're working on, I mean, through Recovery Ministries, we've had Recovery Ready Churches, we've had all of these different things. Um, and because physicians and nurse practitioners and others are, this particular program has been raised to give them continuing medical experiences, et cetera, et cetera. So we've decided to build on that program and have had gotten permission to do so. So we're working to bring that into the Episcopal Church um, and see how that might look for us to be recovery allies, which essentially is, is a safe haven for, for individuals um, with addiction and their families. Um, it's similar and grew out of the safe zone, I think it's called, for, for folks who have who are LGBTQ, um, part of that community, and it just really identifies someone as, um, I'm safe to talk to you about this issue, because until we raise the conversation and we begin talking to one another about it, um, we're gonna continue in, in the epidemic status. And so we had a training in, in Williamsburg um, that was a secular training, and so again, we're, we're massaging and nuancing to figure out how it can look in, in throughout Episcopal churches and for hopefully beyond at some point. Um, we're, we're hopeful that we're going to do a training um, at one of the parishes in, in Richmond. And if it's something that you all are interested in potentially being able to host a training here. Um, certainly for you all as parishioners and for the larger community so that, you know, what, what would it be like for, for Christ and St. Luke's to be a recovery ally, a safe haven for people? What would it be like for, for citizens of Norfolk to be, you know, recovery allies and just have the conversation um, and be able to elevate it and be comfortable having the conversation? When a child says, you know, what am I going to do with my house? Um, you know, there might be needles, or, you know, or that we have to hide or any number of those kinds of things. So just being able to be responsive because we, we walk alongside anyway. Um, it's always interesting and sad to me. Um, we have a center, we have a physical location in Williamsburg, and several of our group of parishioners won't see us at the church, but they'll come to Spirit Works. Um, and while I'm thankful that they come, it would be even more amazing if we could, we could address their issues at the church as part of the larger body of Christ. But the shame and embarrassment that goes along with it, um, and the misunderstanding in, in many regards about, about the nature of it and how people got it and all those kinds of things. Um, so being able to focus on, on, on addiction as an illness, um, misuse is, is, a, is a word that we are offering rather than abuse, right? So when you think of abuse, you think of crime, you think of violence, and, and people who are sick are not inherently criminals or violent. And so being able to change some of that language, because it really matches the science. And so beginning to use science instead of non-science, we'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> science versus non-science, yes. We're gonna have to slip out to get uh, ready for church, but can you just say a brief word about your position? Who pays you? How far of your 
Does your embrace spread formally and informally across the church? It's very curious about that. So I, I, I'm a non-stipendiary deacon, so it, the church does not pay me. Um, we have generous funding. We have a, a contract with the Commonwealth of Virginia to provide the primary support services in really greater Williamsburg, so we do that. We also have a center in Warrington, Virginia, um, and there's a, a foundation that gives us about $100,000 a year to maintain a presence up there. Me, individually, God is good to me. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. I mean, I, most of what I do is, is on my dime, um, and so far, so good. Uh, I, like I said, I just came back from from Florida, that was that was my time and, and, and my money. Um, and and again, I, I don't, you know, I, I just continue to rely on the goodness of God. So um, sometimes my travel is paid for, which is, is wonderful. So I'm going to be going to uh, the Maritime Center in Baltimore to work on uh, church-wide issues, and um, they will they will pay my airline fee or whatever, and, and I'll have a place to stay. But again, that's that's just coming from from me. Um, sometimes I'm able to teach classes and do those kinds of things, and so I will get paid. Usually, sometimes I get the money to Spirit Works um, as a donation so that we can continue to operate. Is Spirit Works a ministry of group parish, or is it? It is a 501c3, so it's separate. Right now, Lauren and I, who are both Episcopalians, work you know at both places. Um, and so we're not a direct ministry of, of Bruton or of anywhere. Um, we, we just happen to, to both work there. I started it before, um, I started Spirit Works in 2005 and it was ordained in 2016. So we've, we've been there for quite some time. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? So one of the things that I wanted to bring your attention to if you're not aware is most people still get their start, if you will, um, from family members and friends. And so um, there's an excess of, of medications that aren't being disposed of. And so one of the things that not only Spirit Works offers, but uh, some of the Department of Health centers offer as well, is drug disposal bags. And so you would just take your leftover medication, open the bag, pour it in here, pour some water in, reseal it, shake it up, and you can stick it in your trash can. Um, drug take backs are wonderful. Um, I'm not always in the place where the drug take back is happening, but I always have access to these bags. So I brought several. Um, if folks have any medication that they want to get rid of, um, I, would, I would beg you <laughs> um, to, to use these and, and get rid of them. Cat litter is also, if, if you don't have access to a bag, cat, cat litter works. And so do Starbucks coffee grounds. Yes. I only Starbucks. I don't have But there, yes. Not an endorsement for Starbucks. Is where um, else could you get that? Because I know a um, lot of kids are given prescriptions for opioids for wisdom. Yep. And then that becomes a problem. So it would be wonderful to know where to sure. get those. So, because they seem to be prescribing excessive amounts. Well, these are available through Department of Health. It, some community services boards have them. We have an appointment for them, so if ever anybody wants some, we're happy to do that. Also, um, Walmart has a powder that if you ask for it, they will give it to you with a prescription, but you have to ask for it. And the powder is that you would just take the powder and put it in a prescription bottle and do the same thing. So it's a, a very effective way. But you've given me an idea. So um, I think it would be an interesting thing to try. We have some friends who are, who are dentists to, when they finish a procedure, to give the kid or family member. Um, so I, the person whose daughter died happens to be a dentist. And so I'm going to approach him next week and ask him if he would, if he would send his patients home with these and that we would supply them forever. Yes. All, most all pharmacies now also have a, 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 dump, yes. a dump box. Right. For, for, for Which is wonderful. The, the piece that is sad, and I will offer you as, as something to think about, um, nowadays when people
people are breaking into folks' houses. They're not stealing televisions or jewelry. They're stealing medication. They're stealing prescription medicine. And so while it is wonderful to leave your house and, and, and dump it in that way, if you can do it in your house, all the better. Because equally, people are watching folks coming and going. Um, and so a lot of it is really about safety and about managing your safety. So yes, those are wonderful things um, to happen there. Uh, if, if ever people can use these, um, I think it's the ideal way to go. I think my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Very grateful for you to be here. And uh, we're very grateful that you came a couple of years ago with Lauren. And it sparked an interest in this parish and considering what we might do. Sure. Sure. As a family as a God. And so we are we are feel like this is kind of the official beginning in a way of what we hope to be a lot in the relationship. And I know when I saw him shaking his head about um, us in a place where you can have a meeting. Yeah, that would be one. And Lauren sends her love. She wanted to be here with me today. She's preaching. So um, she wasn't able to switch. But I, I know that I can speak for both of us that, that we will continue to walk alongside you all no matter what decision you make of level involvement. Um, with any questions that you have, they can find us. Uh, so if there's there's ever any way that we can support you personally, but certainly the parish at